invited to uh, Wednesday's Liver uh, Conference. Uh, today's speaker is Isabel Fiel. Dr. Fiel is a professor of pathology and one of our esteemed hepatobiliary pathologists. She really, we really feel that she's part of our division in liver disease. So uh, we're very happy for her to uh, give us a, a primer, an update for some on uh, liver pathology. So Isabel, thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. It's always a pleasure. I do belong to this division, officially and unofficially. As it's up to you to this, uh, to um, determine that. But yeah, it's uh, always a pleasure, and I see familiar faces and also uh, less familiar faces. But uh, you know, we all belong to uh, the discipline of, of liver and liver pathology. They go together. So. Um, I can't start a lecture on liver without reviewing liver histology. So uh, we, we know the liver as having portal tracts, but actually there are subdivisions in the liver, and we call them the acini or, or the lobules, depending on where, what discipline you come from, whether you're from Europe or you're from the United States. So I interchangeably um, call a lobule or uh, an acinus. A uh, lobule is uh, considered to be um, six portal tracts surrounding a central vein. So the six portal tracts are at the periphery and the central vein is right at the middle of that so-called lobule. So looking at this um, at this particular uh, histomicograph, we have a portal tract with the triad, the artery, the bile duct, and the vein. So uh, it gets old, but I call these two the fraternal twins because they look alike and they're always together, and the portal vein, which is the big sister. And um, the portal tract is made up not only of the triad, but you see a little of um, inflammatory infiltrate, so there's always a sprinkling of inflammatory cells, not to be confused as a chronic hepatitis. And also there's some stroma that pops up all these structures. The hepatocytes around, um, the portal tracts, uh, this is zone one or periportal hepatocytes. They're the hepatocytes that get the most oxygenated blood because the blood is carried into the liver by the hepatic artery and uh, from the mesenteric veins and splenic veins via the portal vein. Um, the bile duct is supplied by the hepatic artery. So if you cut off the blood supply to the bile duct, the bile duct undergoes necrosis and drops out. So. Uh, after blood comes in through the portal vein and hepatic artery, blood percolates through the sinusoids. These are it's a, a high power view of the sinusoid where blood goes through and eventually ends up in the central venia, also known as the central hepatic vein. And this hep central hepatic vein will eventually connect with the hepatic veins and um, be into your vena cava back to the heart. Um, hepatocytes make up most of the cells in the liver. These are the hepatocytes. And the terminal uh, branches of the biliary tree are the canaliculi. So here's the canaliculus made up of about five hepatocytes surrounding this very tiny structure. So the bile that's produced by the hepatocytes are then uh, dumped into these uh, bile canaliculi. The bile canaliculi then connect with the biliary tree, and the bile then gets uh, to the gallbladder. So in addition to the bile canaliculi and hepatocytes and the structures of the portal tract, um, I pointed out the sinusoids, the sinusoidal lining cells, which are made up of endothelial cells, Cooper cells, which are macrophages, but they're specialized macrophages, and the hepatic stellar cells are the vitamin um, storing cells, previously known as the Edo cells. And uh, Scott Friedman and colleagues have extensively studied this. And I'm sure a lot of you uh, are uh, in that group studying the cell itself that then lay down fibrosis. Uh, just a cartoon, just uh, showing the wild up artery and vein and the sinusoids are accentuated and the terminal hepatic venial. So, the indications for a liver biopsy, at the time when I first started as, uh, attending here in 2001, we were so busy with grading and staging chronic hepatitis C. Uh, back then, interferon uh, treatment-based uh, 
uh, treatments uh, were the norm for hepatitis C, chronic hepatitis B, uh, also made us quite busy, um, alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis. So these were uh, the diseases that were biopsied at the time. Um, evaluation of the donor liver also was um, a frequent request uh, in the middle of the night when we were on, on call. So that kept us busy. Um, in the current um, current milieu or environment, the indications for liver biopsy had significantly changed. Most of our biopsies we see in our practice and our uh, sign out uh, at three o'clock are mostly due to fatty liver disease. It could be either non-alcoholic fatty liver disease without hepatitis or um, those already showing significant damage. Alcoholic liver disease, autoimmune hepatitis uh, for grading and staging and to confirm the diagnosis. Sometimes we get challenged by um, overlap syndromes of PDC and autoimmune hepatitis, PSC, autoimmune hepatitis, and uh, other concurrent liver disease along with uh, non alcoholic <coughs> liver disease. Uh, back to uh, the metabolic liver disease, particularly with hemochromatosis, this has been replaced by the genetic test. But Sometimes we do get requests of um, hepatic iron concentration. Um, nowadays, um, this is not really done. And besides, we don't do it here at Mount Sinai. Uh, we send the paraffin block to Mayo Clinic or LabCorp or, or Quest in order to get the hepatic iron concentration. That then leads to uh, you being able to determine the hepatic iron index, which is hepatic iron concentration over the age of the, the patient. Uh, Wilson disease, we still uh, get these biopsies, but very, very rare, as it is uh, an ultra-rare disease. Um, another group of diseases that uh, keeps us busy are the biliary cholangitis, PSC, and PBC. Um, a very challenging diagnosis is that of a small dog PSC. Diagnosis of a liver mass, um, particularly the benign liver lesions of hepatocellular adenoma, a very uh, Rarely do we get biopsies for uh, hepatocellular carcinoma because that's now uh, the ASLD guidelines do not necessarily recommend that the biopsy be done for HCCs that are quite uh, diagnostic on imaging studies. Drug induced liver injury, very, very uh, challenging, but we do see these uh, more and more in our practice. And I, I will discuss at length uh, portal hypertension. Uh, particularly nodular regenerative hyperplasia and obliterative portal venopathy. So let's start with a case. Um, 35 year old woman that presented with abnormal liver enzymes. As you can see, there's a significantly increased transaminases, ALT and AST. IgG was also above uh, the cutoff of 1700 grams, uh, 20, being 2500, and ANA was positive. Quite straightforward. It's autoimmune hepatitis. However, ASLD guidelines recommend that a uh, biopsy be done, and this is the patient's biopsy. This is a portal trap, um, and you can see as compared to the normal portal trap, this portal trap is very heavily infiltrated by mononuclear cells. And you can also see that the surrounding area or the edge of this portal trap is irregular, and this is because of interface hepatitis or interface activity. And the inflammatory cells, if you can appreciate it, are mostly um, plasma cells. So liver biopsy is recommended uh, to establish the diagnosis and to guide uh, treatment. The hallmark, as I had shown you, is the presence of interface hepatitis and the typical inflammatory infiltrate are plasma cells. These are these two are important components, but neither is specific because um, oftentimes there may be concurrent liver disease that you can see, such as fatty liver disease or drug-induced liver injury. The histological changes in autoimmune hepatitis are similar to those of chronic viral hepatitis. The inflammatory infiltrates are mononuclear cells. There are lymphocytes and plasma cells. However, there's a little bit more plasma cell infiltrate, particularly when the plasma cells are occurring in groups and sheets, just like what I showed here in this example, where practically 90% of the infiltrate is made up of plasma cells. 
And if you have the prominent plasma cell infiltrate and interface hepatitis, uh, those two are quite diagnostic. And the presence of significantly uh, increased interface activity is known to um, have more rapid progression. And it's estimated that in 17% of patients with interface hepatitis, they develop cirrhosis within five years. And in some instances, um, with severe autoimmune hepatitis, bridging necrosis, and even massive hepatic necrosis may uh, be present. And uh, with much more uh, damage, uh, this is, uh, again, uh, associated with the greater frequency of cirrhosis and uh, greater mortality. <coughs> and this is an example of an autoimmune hepatitis that presented with a massive hepatic necrosis. So at both ends, you have parenchyma that is still viable, but in the middle, this is uh, collapsed, and we describe this as confluent necrosis. Uh, you, don't, you do not see any viable hepatic parenchyma, hence it's collapsed. And um, if you look at the high power view, you see uh, plasma cells, and they are, are occurring in sheets. So coupled with the uh, immunoglobulin G levels and autoimmune markers, this was pretty straightforward. And just as a, an aside, I couldn't help but put this in. This is a, a patient who was thought to have cirrhosis because of the abnormal uh, shape of the, the liver, but this is this 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 patient's this patient who underwent a transplant. This is her liver. Um, this is uh, multi acinar collapse. These are not cirrhotic nodules. You see areas of collapse right over here, the left lateral segment, and some areas that are dipping down into the uh, parenchyma in the areas that are collapsed. And alternating with these collapsed areas are these regenerative nodules that then leads to a very abnormal configuration. And on, on imaging, this may be mistaken as a cirrhotic liver, as you can see, and you can see why. So moving on to uh, biliary tract diseases, uh, we'll discuss PBC, PSC, and uh, touch on secondary sclerosing cholangitis. Uh, PBC um, is described as the bile duct epithelium being injured and the basement membrane being disrupted. So injury of both the epithelium, the cholangiocytes, and the basement membrane that surrounds the, the bile ducts. And in addition, you'll see an inflammatory reaction. And even better if you see a granuloma surrounding a bile duct that's quite diagnostic. So a fluid duct lesion is pathognomonic. So we see this even in recurrent primary biliary cholangitis. Uh, those who have been transplanted with, uh, for PVC years ago will come back with elevated alkaline phosphatase or other uh, abnormal liver enzymes, and a biopsy may show this classic fluorid duct lesion. What is a fluorid duct lesion? It's just a granuloma surrounding a bile duct, or histocyte surrounding a bile duct. I'm going to outline the bile duct. This is the bile duct. But you have this histocytic reaction around this bile duct along with inflammatory cells. And I mentioned that the basic membrane could also be destroyed. And instead of this round structure here, for comparison, is a normal bile duct. Here's the artery that goes with this bile duct. But if you disrupt the basement membrane, what happens <coughs> to the bile duct? It undergoes some uh, abnormal configuration because there's no more no fibrous tissue that um, confines it into and uh, makes uh, remains uh, to be a uh, circular structure, or an oval-shaped structure. So this is a fluorid duct lesion. This is also considered a fluorid duct lesion. And you can see this lymphohistocytic reaction around these uh, two bile ducts. So this, this, these two features are quite diagnostic. What about an overlap of PBC and autoimmune hepatitis? Um, the, the serum autoantibodies are positive for um, both PBC and PSC. They can be diagnosed simultaneously or sequentially. You have uh, PBC followed by AIH or AIH followed by PBC. Uh, this is a difficult diagnosis. And uh, uh, up to now, there is still no consensus as to how far you have to be uh, following the criteria established by the Paris uh, group or the International Autoimmune Hepatitis group. 
But at least uh, if you were to strictly make a diagnosis of overlap of PBC and PSC, you have to have the clinical, the histological features, um, and the liver enzymes. Both should be significant for both, uh, this, the two diseases. So whichever criteria you care, you uh, follow. The prevalence is estimated to be 2 to 20 percent. I would say that this is the true prevalence is probably in the 5 percent range. Thank you. No comment. Yeah. No okay. So, so, but uh, just to show you that um, the histo histology of um, an overlap of PBC and autoimmune hepatitis, you'll see the flurry duct lesion. Again, this is an example of uh, a bile duct that is being destroyed by inflammatory cells, mainly lymphocytes and a touch of histiocytes. And again, notice the abnormal configuration of this bile duct because of the basement membrane having been destroyed. And on um, the other portal tracts, you'll see significant interface activity. What is interface hepatitis? So say you have a portal tract which is sort of triangular in shape. You have an artery, the bile duct is somewhere here. Uh, it's obscured by the dense inflammatory infiltrate. But if you see these inflammatory cells, filling over into the limiting plate. The limiting plate is that first row of hepatocytes around the portal tract. And you can see here, you have rows of inflammatory cells surrounding the hepatocytes. So this is interface hepatitis. So both <coughs> interface activity and significant interface activity and the fluoride duct lesion is diagnostic for an overlap of BBC and autoimmune hepatitis. So here we have uh, primary sclerosing cholangitis. Um, classically, the uh, PSC affects the larger docs, uh, but there are, uh, is such an entity called the small duct PSC, which I will not discuss here uh, for some other uh, lecture. But by definition, PSC is that of a chronic fibrosing. Here's the blue here on the muscle trichrome. This uh, represents fibrosis. And it's got this concentric type of fibrosis surrounding the bile duct. And eventually, um, this will then disappear. Um, the generation and atrophy of the bile duct epithelium, the basement membrane is intact, in contrast to PBC. And, um, so here's an example of a PSC biopsy here. You have a bile duct. This is the artery that goes with this bile duct that you can see this concentric fibrosis. Eventually, this concentric fibrosis will then encroach upon the bile duct, causing the bile duct epithelium to undergo atrophy. And finally, the bile duct epithelium undergoes total uh, drop out. And this is all that's left. Again, for comparison, you have the artery here. So the bile duct should be at least this size if you were to... Uh, go by the size of the hepatic artery. And the end result will be that of a bile duct scar. Again, the artery is there, and the bile duct is now totally obliterated. We call this the bile duct scar. And those patients, when they lose all, practically all of their bile ducts, will then require a transplant. So this is an explanted liver of a PSC patient. You can see that the left lateral segment, which is segment 2 and segment 3, is markedly hypertrophied. Segment four is a little bit um, relatively atrophic. This is the left lobe, segment four, segment two, segment three, and the caudate lobe. If you flip the liver, the caudate lobe is hypertrophied. So this is a, a, a PSC case, and if you open up the, the bile duct, you may see uh, some very thick bile oozing from the, the, the large ducts. And that's an example. And we pay attention to the biliary tree, uh, particularly in the hilum. So we take sections uh, because of the incidence of uh, dysplasia or even carcinoma uh, developing in PSC patient, patients. And uh, carcinoma, sometimes it, it may be incidental. So this is a case of a PSC patient where we found dysplasia in the, in the docs. The patient didn't have cancer, however. So secondary sclerosing cholangitis, uh, in contrast to PSC, you'll see that the changes 
although they are similar, you have this concentric fibrosis, you see inflammation, uh, the bile duct becomes encroached upon by this uh, onion skin fibrosis. You see the same changes all throughout the liver biopsy. Unlike PSC, where you may have heterogeneous uh, changes, bile ducts in some portal tracts may be unremarkable and in other portal tracts may show this. However, in secondary sclerosis and cholangitis, particularly when uh, it's an acute obstruction of the, the biliary tree, you'll see the same changes all throughout. So this is something that we really uh, rely upon when we're evaluating a liver biopsy. Because uh, uh, if it's an acute process, you see the changes all throughout. And if it's a PSC, which is a more long uh, drawn out process, then you see heterogeneous histology. Some are normal, some are showing concentric fibrosis. And in some instances, we may even see um, cholangitis. So you have here a bile duct that's destroyed, and you see uh, neutrophils in the lumen. So this is a classic example of ascending cholangitis due to a large uh, duct obstruction from, I believe in this case, it was a, a cholidocolitiasis. Any questions so far? OK, so moving on to the alcoholic liver disease. Uh, we, in medical school, we divide alcoholic liver disease into three, hepatic steatosis, alcoholic hepatitis, and alcoholic cirrhosis. But practically all three may overlap. And you may see uh, sometimes just hepatic steatosis, alcoholic hepatitis, and then ongoing alcoholic hepatitis despite the presence of cirrhosis. So just for these pur the purposes of this lecture, I will divide them into three. So hepatic steatosis without evidence of steatohepatitis. So what you will have would be a markedly enlarged liver. So the patient will present with hepatomegaly. Uh, probably bilirubin will be high and uh, is the open phosphatase. At this point in time, when you have this diffuse steatosis, and this is uh, the type that we call macrovesicular. What is the difference between macrovesicular and microvesicular? It's the size of the vacuole. And very easy to identify a macrovesicular when the nucleus is pushed to the side. You have one single vacuole occupying the hepatocyte. So in this case, this is a diffuse type of steatosis. This is a portal tract, uh, but you don't see ballooning degeneration. So this is considered to be reversible if the patient stops drinking. And if, uh, since there is no fibrosis, we, we don't have to deal with any type of regression of fibrosis. The second type is alcoholic hepatitis. You'll see uh, ballooning degeneration right over here. You see neutrophils. This is very helpful uh, in assessing and Mallory Dank Highlands. And to differentiate between NASH versus ASH, we rely on the presence of neutrophils and the number of Mallory Dank Highlands. Uh, but that's always a, a matter of contention because we do see the same in NASH. So we can, unless you give us a history that the patient is a heavy alcohol drinking drinker, we do not uh, want to put that in the final diagnosis as uh, alcoholic steatohepatitis. So we have ballooning degeneration, we have mallory dank highlands, we have neutrophilic infiltrates, and we have fibrosis. So this is the classic chicken wire fibrosis. So this is the central venio, and you have here strands of very delicate connected tissue. We call this sinusoidal fibrosis. Some of these uh, strange strands are surrounding individual hepatocytes. So this is the reason why this is called chicken wire fibrosis. Um, this is a, an example, a different case. This is a uh, liver with numerous mallory dank highlands. So oftentimes the mallory dank highlands are located in hepatocytes that are ballooned. For example, here, this is a hepatocyte that is ballooned with a mallory dank highland in, in the center. Um, so you have numerous mallory dank highlands. You have neutrophils. And then you have the peri uh, sinusoidal chicken wire fibrosis. That's diagnostic and very strongly suggestive of alcoholic steatohepatitis. And those of you who do not know what chicken wire fibrosis <laughs> looks like, this is how it looks like. That's why we, we, we uh, this is very descriptive. Um, so finally, uh, end-stage liver disease from alcohol. Uh, the liver is shrunken. It's usually about 1,000 grams. Normal liver weight is about 1,200 to 1,500 grams in normal livers, uh, normal individuals. 
Shaquille O'Neal, I always say this is that one. I'm sure people have loved. He probably has a 2,500 gram liver, but that's still normal. But here we have a shrunken liver, and this is the histology of this, uh, this liver, where you do not see as many of the balloon hepatocytes, but you, you have this sort of greenish discoloration, and this is because of cholestasis. In the setting of alcoholic hepatitis, this cirrhotic liver can arise from that setting. And uh, just remember that if uh, you are faced with uh, grossing us, us pathologists, we are grossing livers that look like this, we cannot really determine whether it's due to alcohol or hep C or hep B or even autoimmune hepatitis. So brown, shrunken, and most often it's no longer not fatty. So I, I describe this also as the last hurrah. For example, uh, you have very few hepatocytes that contain fat. So the hepatocytes are all burnt out. They, they no longer have the capacity to accumulate fat. Is it okay? Mm -hmm. Just your ketosis, your number one side. You mentioned that it's associated with, with harm serum bilirubin. Can you flesh that out a little bit? I'm, this is in the, the books, but I, I don't really know. Gene may be able to answer that better. Why is there, uh, in, on histology, we don't necessarily see the, the cholestasis, Andrea. Uh, I, mean, I would say that. It depends on how you're, you're categorizing it. So we, in the more current literature, we usually call it this alcoholic fatty liver. Mm -hmm. That's disease, you know, kind of like an apple, right? Um, the, the, if, under that histology, the teaching is that you have these uh, macrovesicular changes, but with abstinence, that can actually revert back to normal within a couple of weeks, all right? So yeah. you can have that hepatomegaly, but typically, that is not consistent with having high serotonin, that is usually more related to uh, you know, the development of alcoholic hepatitis. Yeah, so I think probably, that, yeah. that, that may be uh, maybe it's 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 probably perhaps. The hepatomegaly is definitely there, but then the bilirubin and other phosphates probably belong to the alcoholic hepatitis. Oh, okay. Probably, yeah. but yeah. yeah. What about non alcoholic fatty liver disease? Um, this is described as or defined as having steatosis great, affecting greater than 5% of the parenchyma. So you're always allowed a little bit of steatosis as long as it's, as it's less than 5%. So sometimes that's tricky because uh, it's quite subjective when you, you, you look at a biopsy. Um, but less than 5%, 5 or less is considered normal. Um, what about non alcoholic steatohepatitis? hepatitis? This is a subgroup of NAFLD that relies heavily on um, biopsy. Again, here we have uh, steatotic uh, liver, we have macrovesicular, and we have mediovesicular steatosis, the smaller droplets. Um, there's no balloony degeneration here, or maybe over here is a balloon hepatocyte, but just for comparison, this is our normal liver. You don't see any vacuole whatsoever. And this is a biopsy of a patient with NASH. Here you can see ballooning degeneration. Here's another one. And inflammatory infiltrate. The most important is the presence of ballooning degeneration because the inflammatory infiltrate, both lobular and portal, may not be there. But if you have ballooning degeneration, that's enough to call it NASH. And of course, uh, NASH mimics uh, alcoholic hepatitis or alcoholic hepatitis, you have, again, macrovesicular steatosis, but uh, the inflammation may not be the neutrophilic infiltrate that I showed you earlier, but more of um, lymphocytic infiltrate, as shown in this example. You'll also see ballooning degeneration, you'll see Mallory Bank bodies, uh, but they're uh, less frequent as compared to the alcoholic liver disease. And the pericellular or perivenar fibrosis is similar to that of alcoholic yeah, hepatitis. And this is the end result of NASH. Uh, it's a cirrhotic liver. Here you see nodularity. This is a, a, an architectural distorted liver because you have bridging fibrosis and nodular architecture. Here you have a nodule uh, with a septum uh, surrounding the nodule about 60%. So by definition, that's a cirrhotic uh, liver. 
the diagnostic challenges in NAFLD, I, I think I, I just attended the, um, the ASLD um, conference a couple of weeks ago, and it's still a challenge because uh, there is no uh, non-invasive test that can determine the presence of NASH. Uh, you still need a biopsy, and that's uh, the consensus amongst these uh, experts in, uh, in Washington, D.C. That, that met. So the liver enzymes may be normal or only minimally elevated despite severe NASH. Concurrent alcoholic liver injury and NASH may occur. In fact, when we cite out biopsies, and if we suspect that there's a little bit of alcohol mixed in there, we call it alcoholic and or non-alcoholic hepatitis in our di diagnosis. Uh, Drug-induced liver injury. So that's also something that may be concurrently seen in the liver <coughs> and very, it's very difficult to uh, tease out from uh, NAFLD alone. And metabolic liver diseases, and I just uh, bring attention to the LAL deficiency cases because this is not just a disease of uh, the young or uh, the pediatric population, but also seen in even in older individuals. So just one example here, I'm going to give a, a, bios, a test of the already gave out the way the diagnosis. It's a patient with celiac disease. <laughs> I should have put that in the next 29-year-old uh, uh, with abnormal liver uh, tests, uh, elevated alt -AST. Alcohol, bilirubin, um, serologic workup negative. The patient complains of weight loss and bloating. Um, and a duodenal biopsy showed uh, features consistent with celiac disease. Here we have her liver biopsy, as you can see. Very commonly seen in, in, in our practice, we have steatosis and a touch of portal inflammation and uh, some foci of lobular inflammation. So both lobular and portal inflammation and steatosis in the parenchyma. So here the patient didn't have any other risk factors so we were able to uh, make a diagnosis of fatty liver disease secondary to celiac disease and the non-specific hepatitis. So this is something that I, I think clinicians should also remember that it's not just the, the risk factors that are familiar to us but Sometimes um, celiac disease and, and even Crohn's disease may present <coughs> with uh, fatty liver disease. And this is just one example. non serotic portal hypertension. Um, in the Western world, the incidence of <coughs> non serotic portal hypertension is estimated to be about 3 to 5 percent. Uh, the disorders that are associated or present with portal hypertension, non serotic livers, schistosomiasis, congenital hepatic fibrosis, portal vein thrombosis, but carry fat, even fatty liver disease in the absence of, of significant fibrosis may present with portal hypertension. Collagen vascular diseases, myeloproliferative disorders, long-term hemodialysis, sarcoidosis, and congestive heart failure. And we do get a lot of uh, patients who are in the, in the heart transplant list or list for heart transplant. Uh, they do biopsies on those patients. I'm going to um, concentrate on the non serotic portal hypertension that we are now seeing more and more in, um, on a daily basis. Almost, uh, practically uh, almost every day that we see uh, an OPV or a, a nodular regenerative hyperplasia. So the synonyms for uh, OPV, uh, INCPH, non serotic portal fibrosis, this is a uh, a term uh, known in India, hepatoportal sclerosis. This is a term applied to uh, this entity in the Western world. Idiopathic portal hypertension. This is a term applied to by the Japanese. Uh, there's a, some um, some subtle differences in in these uh, entities, but the bottom line is that OPV uh, is has heterogeneous histology, as I will show you. Uh, this is an example of a patient that presented with uh, low platelets and uh, bleeding varices. And the uh, biopsy shows these densely fibrotic portal tracts. And the vein, as if you remember that normal portal tract that I uh, presented earlier in my talk, where the vein should be this size, here the vein is markedly diminished in caliber. Uh, and here, this is another portal tract. This time you have dense portal fibrosis. The vein is no longer present, but you have the bollock and the artery. So we call this phlebosclerosis. So 
either you have diminished portal vein branches or lumina and or you have phlebosclerosis where the portal vein is totally obliterated. Another feature <coughs> of OPV is the dilatation or herniation of the portal vein. Here's the portal tract. The vein should be right in the middle of the portal tract, but instead it's dilated all the way out. It's sort of reaching out into the, the central vein. Um, this is another feature, and here's a, another portal vein that is markedly herniated out and even branching out over to the central lobular area. The vein, which should be here, is no longer present, but rather it's at the periphery. It also creates paraportal shunts. So here is a bile duct. The artery is here. Um, there are too many portal vein radicals here. You have four. And this is an attempt to relieve the portal hypertension. Sometimes uh, it's as dramatic as this, but sometimes it may be very subtle. For example, here's a portal trap. Instead of the vein being in the center, you have the portal vein branches at the periphery. Uh, some of these are not the real portal veins. Some of these are the septal venules, which are located at the periphery of the portal tract. They also become dilated. So the creation of paraportal shunts, phlebosclerosis, uh, herniated portal veins, and you have sinusoidal dilatations. Here's a portal tract, another portal tract. Towards the central lobular area, the, uh, the hepatocytes become atrophic. The portal tracts are approximating each other as shown here. This is because of parenchymal atrophy. So remember, you have two-thirds of the blood coming from the portal vein and one-third oxygenated blood coming from the hepatic artery. But if you cut off the blood supply of that two-thirds coming from the portal vein, what will uh, happen is that there will be less blood going into the parenchyma that then results in parenchymal atrophy. And this is a really cool example of parenchymal atrophy where the portal tract should be distant from each other, such as here where my light is. Uh, but here instead, you have portal tracts that are very close to each other. So the bottom line is that this um, OPV can be very, very subtle. And we have had many cases uh, in our consultation practice that sent to us as being normal. But then the clinician asked for us to review the biopsy. And we, we find out that it's really got a um, OPV, obliterate portal venopathy. Can I ask, has anybody, has anybody been doing fiber scan in these patients? Because in principle, that should be normal, right? Yeah, that's one of the reasons why biopsy, fiber scan cannot pick, pick this up. Because right, there's exactly. No, yeah. So if you have portal hypertension and you have a biopsy that's underwhelming, uh, yeah, or even before you do the biopsy, if your stiffness is normal, then you might think about that. Yeah. So we've been seeing that OPV diagnosis, I think, a little bit more frequently recently, especially in some kind of mild, normal kind of cases, or like mild, not specific yeah. hepatitis, things like that. Do you think that sampling has any role in terms of the diagnosis of OPV, or, or you know, or every portal tract should be having no, some evidence no, of things? So no, so, uh, in, that's a really great uh, uh, point, because some portal tracts may be totally normal. And then the, the portal tract right next to it may show these paraportal shots, may show some uh, herniated uh, portal vein branches, or maybe even phlebosclerosis. Uh, yeah, so it's heterogeneous. But the end result, and I think Jim and I were discussing this uh, earlier today, the end result of the portal vein um, obliteration will be uh, uh, an entity called um, transition cirrhosis, incomplete septal cirrhosis. And this was described by Hans Popper, uh, where these nodularities are, are located near the hilum, but the rest of the, the parenchyma, like the more uh, peripheral liver, is totally normal. But you do see the changes right next to the hilum, maybe near, near uh, where the, the orthohepatis is. Um, yeah, so it's heterogeneous histology. If you biopsy from uh, like a transjugular vein, you may be able to see dense fibrosis, but then if you do a percutaneous biopsy, you, may, you might see totally normal liver. But sampling is a great uh, issue if you have um, adequate tissue. For example, if you have two centimeters or more, I'm sure that you'll be able to identify these uh, changes in some of the port tracks. So the second um, entity
toxicity that can give rise to non-serotipole hypertension is nodular regenerative hyperplasia. This is a patient that uh, had um, severe portal hypertension and got transplanted. This is the cut surface of the liver. Uh, and on imaging, this was uh, read as a cirrhotic liver, micronodular type. Um, and you can see why, because you, the cut surface shows a diffuse nodular um, appearance. However, there's no fibrosis. Um, this NRH can be found in myeloproliferative disorders, collagen vascular diseases, medications, um, particularly HIV individuals who have been on the first generation antiretroviral agents, um, DDI uh, particularly, can give rise to nodular regenerative hyperplasia. And the definition of NRH is the compression of liver cell plates in between hyperplastic uh, nodules, as shown here. This is a liver biopsy. This is a reticulin stain where you see a nodule, but this nodule is not surrounded by fibrous septa, but rather by atrophic hepatocyte plates. So you have another nodule here. So what's separating these two nodules is not dense collagen, but rather uh, reticulin fibers that are closer to each other. That's because there's atrophy of the hepatocyte plates. And here's a tiny nodule. On HME, this is a rather uh, dramatic type of NRH presentation. You don't get it, uh, this uh, dramatic in, in a liver biopsy. but. Uh, just to highlight that there is reverse lobulation. So initially, when I first started this talk, I described the lobule with the six portal tracts at the periphery. Here, you have reverse lobulation where the portal tract is now in the middle of that nodule. Again, the nodule is made up of hyperplastic hepatocytes and the atrophic hepatocyte plates are at the periphery. So I... I, I think of NRH as this uh, cabbage uh, where there's no fibrosis uh, delineating the nodule. So the diagnostic challenge in OPV and NRH um, is because are the following. If the pathologist is not aware of this entity or you guys did not provide a history of the patient having portal hypertension. So if you do a biopsy, give uh, that information that the patient has uh, you know, low platelets or has bleeding varices because, again, um, this can be considered a normal liver, but if you look at these, you have some herniated portal veins and markedly dilated portal veins over here and sinusal dilatation. So the, these changes are subtle and they may be easily overlooked. So going to um, the neoplasms of the liver, HCC, cholangiocarcinoma, it's either intrahepatic or the flat skin, very high carcinoma, combined HCC and fibrolamellar carcinoma. So a well-differentiated hepatocellular carcinoma is very easy to make a diagnosis. Um, here you see thickening of the hepatocyte plates and you don't see any portal tracts. You, you do, um, you can appreciate the hepatocytes as being very similar to the he benign hepatocytes. The only thing that is helpful here is that the hepatocyte plates are quite thick instead of the single cells that make up a trabeculum. Uh, here you see three or four, even five cells that make up the trabeculae. And here's an unpaired artery as well. Modern to differentiate HCC is starting to become more challenging, but you still uh, are able to identify the hepatocytic nature of the neoplasm. Here you see endothelial cells that wrap around these trabeculae. This trabeculum is made up of two cells. Here you have about three cells, so they have, you have thickening of that trabeculae. And the poorly differentiated, this is quite challenging because you have, you can see this in sarcomatoid HCC, you can see this in, even in poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. So, um, we do need immunostains to be able to um, make that diagnosis. When there's uncertainty in the diagnosis of HCC, such as the one I showed you earlier, such as this, the third one, we have very helpful stains. We have the reticulin stain, where you have disruption of the reticulin fibers or total absence of the reticulin fibers. And very helpful in... Uh, making a diagnosis of a tumor being of hepatocytic origin when you perform a polyclonal CEA where the canalicular structures are highlighted 
and you can see the sort of spidery type of a positive canaliculi. So this is diagnostic for HCC. In fully differentiated tumors such as this, a HEPFAR immunostain is also quite helpful. This is uh, challenging. Um, therefore, we revert to uh, performing immunostains. Uh, very frequently, we get this type of specimen, a non serotic liver. This is a patient with hepatitis B who presents with a, a mass. This is in the left lateral segment. Uh, you can see that there is no nodularity. The mass is well delineated. We describe this as tan, red in color, with an area of hemorrhage, uh, well circumscribed. It's uh, about 1.5 centimeters distant from the resection margin. So those are very important gross pathologic features that we identify. Uh, in contrast, here we have an explanted liver. You see two dominant nodules. This nodule is a totally necrotic nodule. This has been uh, treated with adjuvant therapy, I think radiofrequency ablation as well. And this is a viable hepatocellular carcinoma. So our eyes are sort of drawn into these two nodules. So this is viable, this is not. However, uh, in our practice, we do ha have uh, serial sections of the liver to identify sub-centimeter nodules. We call these dysplastic nodules. Here's the one. Um, and here's another one. Uh, these are the dysplastic nodules that may harbor in situ hepatocellular carcinoma or even frank HCC. But um, we, uh, we need histology to be able to make that determination. Vascular invasion. This is gross vascular invasion. It's a large portal vein with tumor in it. That's uh, indicative of poor prognosis. So notice that there's no tumor anywhere around. So this Tumor thrombus must be coming from elsewhere in a different segment. But we identify this because of our serial sectioning of, of the liver. How about cholangiocarcinoma? Um, anywhere in the biliary tree, uh, this tumor can arise, the Klatskin tumor or the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. 10% uh, of PSC patients will develop cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, other risk factors are clonorthosis sinensis, Carolis disease, cholidocal cyst, and recurrent pyogenic cholangitis with hepatolithiasis. Uh, here's an example, two examples of a uh, clad skin tumor. Here's the uh, main duct, and you can see that there's this mass that's surrounding the, this duct. And this patient presented with uh, obstructive symptoms and jaundice. Uh, the resection um, here is, the tumor is very close to the resection margin. I, I don't think that they could get any more. Um, but here you see a lobectomy specimen. Um, this is a former fellow who was very good at identifying the, the structures. Here's a common duct, the, the left hepatic duct. Uh, this was a right lobectomy. So the margins that we are concerned with are the left hepatic duct margin and the common hepatic duct margin. Um, because the, the right hepatic duct is already inside this, this liver. So we, we are not up. So again, that is a very um, a major a mistake sometimes uh, in grossing a specimen. The histology of cholangiocarcinoma is that of an adenocarcinoma accompanied by extensive desmoplasia. Here's a nerve. Uh, this is also a tumor that's very notorious in um, having perineural invasion. So that's a nerve twiglet there, and then you have a glandular structures accompanied by desmoplasia. So that's a cholangiocarcinoma. What about intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma? Gross pathology, we see a, a single mass with this uh, sort of lobulated architecture. The borders are sort of rounded like this. And on histology, you see an adenocarcinoma. Here's the normal um, non-neoplastic liver over here. Uh, you may see a central necrosis in an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, more and more, we are seeing in, uh, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas in patients with hepatitis C. We used to think of hepatitis C as giving rise to hepatocellular carcinomas, but approximately 20% of our resections of uh, hepatitis C cirrhosis, uh, uh, we have uh, cholangiocarcinoma instead. Uh, immunostains are helpful. Uh, these are the biliary markers, so either one of these, uh, but really we do not need it to do immunostains if we are. Uh, we, have the, the, the resection specimen. Or on the, in cases of liver biopsies, we know that it's a single mass and there's no other primary. So we do not need to do all these uh, immunostains. 
which is very expensive. So what about combined HCC cholangiocarcinoma? We have a panel of immunostains to um, help us. This is the hepatocyte carcinoma component here. This is the cholangiocarcinoma component over here. So this is a combined HCC cholangiocarcinoma. HEPFAR positive in the HCC component and CK7 positive in the cholangiocarcinoma component. Uh, even more challenging when you are faced with a, a mixed tumor with stem cell features, like over here. The cells are much smaller and they uh, show the stem cell markers. Uh, CD56 is one of the stem cell markers, and you notice that the uh, cells, the tumor cells, are positive for a stem cell marker. Um, that's for uh, <coughs> that. That's that for the primary liver cancers, uh, metastatic tumors. Uh, we see more of these uh, than the primary liver cancer. Mostly metastatic tumors from the GI tract, the breast. Uh, we also see frequently neuroendocrine tumors. We have all these immunostains that uh, confirm or rule out a <coughs> primary uh, site. But in this particular case, this photomicrogram is showing some pigment. Dr. Zhu is here, I think. Oh, there. Um, the pigment, um, that's very helpful. And Dr. Zhu just made a diagnosis of metastatic melanoma that was mistakenly diagnosed as uh, sarcoma. Um, so the pigment is very helpful because this is a pigment that you only see in melanomas. So this is metastatic to the liver. What about benign liver lesions? Uh, I will, we deal with FNH and hepatocellular adenoma. FNH is rarely biopsied because it's a, a quite diagnostic on imaging. You have the central stellate scar. Um, so no additional studies are, are done. Some, sometimes we do encounter this specimen because uh, a woman who is planning on getting pregnant would like to, to have uh, the tumor taken out. And uh, histologically, you see the central stellate scar uh, having this radiating or septa that emanate from the central scar. And it, within the central scar, you see abnormal vessels here. Uh, and oftentimes, these fibrous septa will extend out into the parenchyma and wrap around nodules. That's why this can be mistaken as cirrhosis. So again, if you do a biopsy or a radiologist does a biopsy, it's imperative that the uh, information that this is coming from a single mass be given to the pathologist. Otherwise, we would go as a, a cirrhotic liver. And glutamine synthetase is very helpful. It shows the map-like pattern of, of staining in focal nodular hyperplasia. And hepatocellular adenoma, it's a benign tumor. 15% uh, of these patients present with bleeding, and malignant transformation um, is another complication uh, occurring in about 4 to 8%. But only this malignant transformation is found in a certain subtype of hepatocellular adenoma. The risk uh, or HCA development is associated with oral contraceptive use. Therefore, HCAs are mostly found in women of childbearing age, although in males, uh, we are seeing this more and more in, in young males who are on androgen use or um, males who are obese. Um, the classical type of uh, classification of HCA, uh, there were four, uh, HNF1 alpha inactivated, making up uh, the majority as, along with the inflammatory hepatocellular adenoma, and a subtype of inflammatory hepatocellular adenoma may be beta catenin activated. Uh, and then the fourth one is the unclassified. But we, re we require five immunostains, CRP, SAA, glutamine synthetase, LFADP, and beta catenin to be able to subtype the hepatocellular adenoma. This is a HNF1 alpha inactivated hepatocellular adenoma that presents <laughs> with fatty uh, infiltrates. So this is a very steatotic. Uh, hepatocellular adenoma and the liver fatty acid binding protein, LFADP, uh, is not expressed. So this is quite diagnostic for the subtype we call HNF1 alpha inactivated hepatocellular adenoma. So not too long ago, uh, the group from Jessica Zuckman Rossi came up with even more uh, subtypes. You have the HNF1 alpha, you have the beta catenin activated 
hepatocyte adenoma associated with CTNNB1, exon 7 and 8, and another beta catenin activated associated with exon 3 mutation. And then you have the inflammatory hepatocyte adenoma, sonic hedgehog, and then the unclassified is now becoming less and less in uh, um, composition. So more recently, uh, here is the arginosuccinate synthase 1 hepatocyte adenoma, AS1, uh, which is a subgroup identified as being uh, associated with bleeding. So the clinical uh, symptoms that in, during presentation is that of hemorrhage and, and bleeding. And this is uh, AS1 is proposed as a marker of uh, new subtype, um, AS1 positive HCA. Um, yeah. So this is a case of a uh, hepatocyte adenoma that presented with bleeding. In this particular uh, uh, cut surface, you see uh, multiple adenomas, all of them showing a bleeding on the cut surface. And uh, there's a, an immunostain that is available to identify AS1 positivity. Here you see a blush of brown staining. This is considered positive in this patient who presented with massive uh, peritoneal uh, bleeding. And you can see that there's this uh, track of, of uh, blood that is uh, dissecting through the, uh, the tumor. This is the tumor. So I, I think I will end here. Um, we have five minutes. So I will end here. Here I, I have uh, other slides but for next time. But thank you very much for attending. Say that you mentioned some subtle things that you see to try to distinguish between those two types. Can you give us a little bit of pearls between you know the, those two clinical scenarios? What is it about you know in the fatty liver disease that points you more to alcohol? Let's start with that. Let's start with that. The myriad bodies okay. and the neutrophils. I from my uh, you know from my experience, I don't really see that many neutrophils in Nash. But you do see a significant, in, in the rip roaring alcoholic theater, you see numerous neutrophils. Uh, so that's one. And then the Mallory Dank bodies, you don't see too many well formed Mallory Dank bodies in, in NASH. You see them as form and scattered about. But in, again, in, in the classical ASH, you see numerous um, Mallory Dank highlights. And then the second question um, alcohol. Uh, Autoimmune disease versus autoimmune disease with Dilly. Right. Um, and I'll add to that autoimmune um, hepatitis triggered by Dilly, right? Uh, so those are three different scenarios that you can, uh, and, and very, very difficult. Uh, sometimes uh, in autoimmune, the classical autoimmune hepatitis, you see portal based inflammation and central based inflammation. And the, the, the lobule. Is untouched. You know, you, you see pristine hepatic parenchyma. Whereas in Dilly with autoimmune hepatitis, the entire parenchyma is involved. That's from my experience. That's that. Uh, uh, but yeah, I, I think that's something that uh, I 
sort of uh, help, let me help uh, help me in making that diagnosis and making that deliberation between pure autoimmune hepatitis or autoimmune hepatitis with Dilly or Dilly itself that has autoimmune features. All right, thank you, Dr. Thiel.